everyone. Uh, welcome to Ubi Petrus, especially uh, hello to our patrons. Today we've got a very nice uh, interview for you today. We are interviewing Dr. David Bradshaw, who is an uh, Orthodox Professor of Philosophy at the University of Kentucky. How are you doing? Hi, just fine. Good to be with you. And we also have Ubi with us, uh, of course. How hello, are you doing? good morning. I'm doing well, Dr. Bradshaw. It's such an honor to have you on. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I really appreciate the work you all do. And I think it's uh, bringing a lot of light <laughs> onto the Internet. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. So thank you so much for that compliment. So uh, today we're basically going to be talking about uh, this is kind of an addendum to our long video that we did on um, contraception and Christian historical thought. And we, we kind of spoke about natural law towards the end very briefly because kind of the video was more of a historical uh, analysis. Um, and Dr. Bradshaw actually has a, pa a paper. What is coming up is forthcoming in a publication, you said? Mm -hmm. uh, a journal called Christian Bioethics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's called, um, what does it mean to be contrary to nature mm -hmm. and you talk about uh natural law at least in the scholastic sense um and also you sent me a a, a piece as well which is the ancient faith radio uh, ancient faith radio or ancient faith ministries article series that i actually enjoyed a lot more than the contrary to nature mm -hmm. maybe because it was more of um socio-political commentary um and it did actually i really enjoyed it. it really um kind of shifted my thinking even and that's uh, called Christian sexual ethics, where it went wrong, I think, or what went wrong. What went wrong with Christian sexual ethics, right? Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah, that you can find that one online. Uh, I think the blog is called Every Thought Captive. Um, it's one of the ancient faith blogs. So just as a we'll preliminary question. We'll include that in the uh, video description. Yes, I'm going to put it in the description. Um, so just as a preliminary question, what kind of got you because you're well known in our circles for kind of the book Aristotle, East and West, you know, it's quite a heavy metaphysical book. So what got you interested in kind of writing about um, like the sexual ethics and um, that kind of stuff, these two papers? Yeah, I guess it began with um, a conference at um, Holy Cross Monastery that was organized by um, some folks I know, like David Ford, who teaches at St. Tikhon's. Um, and uh, Alf Sievers, he teaches at Bucknell. And it was a conference on um, chastity, integrity, and I forget the third, may, might be holiness. But anyway, it was a, it was a conference on understanding um, orthodox teaching and practice about sexuality in relation to modern culture and how, of course, of course is so different. And so the paper I wrote was called Orthodoxy and the Beauty of Chastity. And that one too, you can find online. And um, I, I mainly focused on the Akathist service <clears throat> as an example of how orthodoxy, <clears throat> even though, you know, there's clearly a sexual ethic, right? Of course, there's a sexual ethic in the Bible and, and we teach that and, and, and try to practice it. Um, there's not as nearly as much emphasis as typically in the West on, you might say, rules to follow and uh, sort of a formal code of ethics. There's much more emphasis on, on devotion to the saints, uh, per perhaps especially the Theotokos, as ones who lead us into a life of chastity. And in particular, in the Akathist, you know, what, something you see very beautifully is how chastity emerges from repentance. And you really can't um, achieve chastity, which is a kind of a purity before God, without repenting. Um, and not only repenting of, of sexual sin, I mean, that's just a small part of it. Uh, and the, the Theotokos is the model of that kind of purity. And so, um, you know, I think it's important that, that Orthodox um, speak to the modern world out of the richness of the Orthodox tradition and not just sort of conform ourselves to Western ways of thinking. So anyway, it was a t an attempt to do that. And that got me into the, just thinking about what is really distinctive about the Orthodox approach to sexual ethics. 
And so, uh, like you mentioned, I wrote then a couple of other papers dealing with the same issue. Um, and it's ongoing. I think that I, I, actually a shorter version of the, the paper on what it means to be contrary to nature, I'm planning to present at the, um, the big ne next big meeting, the International Orthodox Theological Association, and just try to get um, you know, more discussion going among Orthodox scholars uh, in retrieving the Orthodox tradition and trying to sort of, you know, bring it into the modern world in a fruitful way, so. I think you make some very salient points. I think one of the things that got my attention was how you talk about how you kind of analogize it to the development of Trinity and Christology face to, you know, bigger significant challenges. And I think you really make a good point that today, nowadays is really the big, we're getting this big surge of challenge against norms of sexual ethics that have been Christian for so long that we really kind of need a, 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 a shifting of, of emphasis, a shifting of where we're, we're getting our notions of what's, you know, proper and how we should view like marital intimacy and, and, and Christian um, like living between a husband and a wife and chastity, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with respect to those um, kind of, West, uh, you know, those the, the traditional kind of Christian stuff in the West, maybe. Um, nat natural law obviously figures in, or seems to figure in very heavily. Could you explain to us what exactly natural law is, or how it was conceived? And also, if you could give like a kind of a brief history of, of it, where it came from? Yeah, well, the term uh, can mean many different things. I mean, there's natural law in science, right? Obviously, that's not what we're talking about. But even just within ethics and the Christian tradition, I think it's used in two different ways. There's sort of natural law in a broad sense in which um, you understand uh, nature as through its um, constitution, its organization, indicating uh, the governance of a, of a benevolent creator and thereby giving us some basic moral direction in life, you might say. And this was a widely held view, um, even in pre-Christian times. You can find people like Philo Alexandria, he's one, and Cicero, of course, um, you know, Philo writing in Greek, Cicero in Latin, so you have East and West, who are both are very emphatic about this. And uh, scholars, I think, have kind of traced that back, you know, to their to the two sort common source would be probably um, within Middle Platonism that kind of synthesized ideas from Plato with ideas from Stoicism. So there was an author named Antiochus of Ascalon whose works don't survive anymore, but he was probably sort of the common source for both Cicero and Philo. And uh, the Greek fathers adopt this uh, sort of an approach and you find it uh, quite commonly, uh, for instance, uh, St. John Chrysostom often refers to natural law or the guidance of nature or what have you in all sorts of ways. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's fully orthodox and it simply recognizes that, uh, you know, as St. Paul says in Romans 2, that there's a kind of a law written on the heart that can be known to all peoples who are open to um, recognizing the reality of God that's evident within nature. And so um, that I think is, is, you know, an important aspect or an important value that natural law thinking does have. Um, uh, people like Aquinas in the West kind of systematize it based largely on Cicero and other Western authors. And, um, you know, you get what's called the treatise of law in the Summa Theologia that describes sort of the different levels of natural teleology that you find in man from the basic natural functions of life and reproduction that we share with, with uh, all living things, then the more distinctively animal functions, the, the animal level of the soul uh, involving uh, uh, perception and motion and imagination, and, and then the distinctively rational functions that are also distinctively social and human. And, um, as far as I'm aware, <laughs> I, uh, there's nothing in that that Orthodox would necessarily object to. Uh, it seems to me like probably uh, a very fruitful kind of synthesis. But 
Um, that's distinct from another way that people have of referring to natural law as um, what's a more distinctively Western idea, and I think problematic, that um, each natural faculty, each bodily faculty, has a kind of a natural telos um, that defines what it's right to do with that particular bodily faculty. And the idea is that you should never interfere with that, with the, op with the achievement of that natural telos, even in any individual act. Um, and so this is usually specifically referring to the sexual faculty, and it becomes the way of kind of providing a rationale for um, the rejection in the West of what in, in Western scholastics came to be called the sin against nature. And um, as I think you know, I mean, your, your video made a lot of use of John Noonan's book on contraception. And that's, a, that's really a, just a superb work of scholarship. And he traces the development of this idea of the sin against nature in uh, Western scholasticism, beginning with Augustine and uh, really then um, the, it's the way that Augustine is sort of selectively appropriated by uh, Gratian, who wrote the Decretum, um, you know, the kind of the foundational work of Western canon law. And then also Peter Lombard in his commentary on the sentences. Uh, those were both writing in the 1150s. And then scholastics uh, writing in their wake, like Alexander of Hales and Thomas Aquinas, um, kind of systematize what they do into this idea of the sin against nature that is uh, specifically a sexual kind of sin. And then as they kind of break it down, takes various forms such as uh, bestiality and anal intercourse and also same-sex intercourse, but also uh, things like uh, the wrong uh, position, even between a married man and woman. Um, and, and also uh, coitus interruptus, what they called onanism, you know, the sin of onan. Um, well, uh, they kind of, the way they try to unify those as, as different forms of one sin called the sin against nature is that they're all ways of interfering with the achievement of the natural telos of the sexual faculty, which of course is procreation. And so any kind, for Aquinas, any kind of uh, intercourse that um, deliberately prevents that from occurring, deliberately prevents the um, procreative uh, deliverance of the semen to the female is um, a form of the sin against nature. And so that then kind of gets codified into um, Roman Catholic canon law. And you can find a lot of instances of that in uh, Denzinger, you know, the Enchiridion that I, I cite in my paper, uh, where it's also, for instance, uh, the rationale for, for prohibiting um, uh, sterilization um, and even uh, masturbation, which occasionally sometimes has a medical purpose. I mean, there can be reasons that a, a man might need a semen sample for some kind of diagnosis or a treatment of a disease. And that's actually forbidden. Uh, in Roman Catholic canon law uh, for this reason, that it would be a use of the sexual faculty in a way that is deliberately non-procreative. Um, now, what, what, what all that is grounded in is this other idea of natural law, law that each distinct bodily faculty has its own natural end and should be used only to achieve that end, or at least that to, to use it in a way that's deliberately uh, sort of short-circuiting that end is, is intrinsically wrong and can never be permitted, even if there are countervailing reasons, you know, like, like curing a disease um, that might seem to go the other way. Um, that, like I said, that's distinctively Western and actually uh, really only developed in the Middle Ages. Um, and it's not something you find in classical sources. It's not in Aristotle. Uh, it's not in the Stoics. People like Philo and Cicero, when they talk about natural law, don't uh, say anything like that. And it's also not in the Greek fathers. So that's why I say it's distinctively Western, and I think it's problematic. I mean, we, we can get into that if you like. Um, 
but it's it's a different way of thinking about natural law that's much more uh, kind of focused. And and even Aquinas, when he develops this view about the sin against nature, it's interesting that he doesn't really try to connect it back to his own theory of natural law in the treatise on law. These are at widely separated places in the Summa Theologia. And, uh, you know, in other works like the Summa Contra Gentiles, uh, he also talks about the sin against nature, but he doesn't really put it in the context of his broader theory of natural law. So that's why I think there are just two different meanings of that phrase, natural law, within Christian ethics. And uh, the first one is widespread, it's shared, it's common to the East and West, but the second is not. And so I think that's why it's important to distinguish those. Do you have any, um, anything to ask, Ubi? I'll just make sure that whenever Dr. Bradshaw finishes responding that you can say something if you'd like to. Well, first, I found your paper to be really, really edifying. Um, you've provided us with a large amount of materials uh, and recommendations for our, our videos, specifically the ones on essence energies and um, the contraception one. And there were a few quotations from the paper, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if I could read them out and would you be willing to oh, yeah. uh, comment on them? Absolutely. So, sure. um, and by the way, for anyone who's listening, please do not email me asking me for a copy of the paper because the paper will be published and it was provided to me on the condition that I do not share it. So please do not ask me for a copy. Um, one of them, it says, that's so about 10 lines on, it says, uh, the ancient argument, at least as advanced by Plato, frankly avowed its confidence in the form of divine governance of nature. The details are left sketchy and no doubt vary greatly from one author to another. Nonetheless, all were confident that nature reflects the wisdom and providence of God or the gods. Accordingly, they assume that the evident natural ordering of the sexual organs, their, quote, key and lock, unquote, quality, so to speak, can be taken as a reliable guide to how they are to be used. The natural law argument found in authors like Fesser also looks to this natural ordering, but it does so without reference to a divine origin. Instead, it attempts to substitute the idea that each natural faculty has an Aristotelian telos possessing intrinsic normative force. As I have argued, this idea leads to absurd results and is a, an alien graft upon a risk which does not allot to each bodily faculty a separate ethical normative telos. So you had you'd mentioned this when you were giving the overview of natural law, and I found that quotation to be very poignant. Um, it, it really, uh, let's see, with, looking for this other one, uh, because you had brought up things like chewing gum, what is the point of chewing, or Fesser rather had brought up chewing gum, you know, it's using the mm -hmm. digestive faculty, but not for the purpose of digesting. Well, you had taken a step further and brought up a treadmill. Would you care to comment on that or to explain what you meant in regards to the treadmill? Yeah, so um, there's an essay by uh, Edward Fazer, this Catholic author called In Defense of the Perverted Faculty Argument. And anyone interested, I think you can find that one online. And it tries to give a kind of a contemporary defense of this Western idea of natural law in which there's uh, an overriding moral obligation to uh, use each bodily faculty in accordance with its own natural telos, or at least not to use it in a way that deliberately contravenes and, and, and uh, renders fruitless that telos. So, uh, Phaser has to face objections like, well, <laughs> what about chewing gum? Uh, because I'm using my digestive faculty, my mouth, to do something that isn't contributing to digestion. Um, and he says, oh, well, so that's not really a counterexample because you're not deliberately frustrating the achievement of digestion. You're just using the faculty for a different purpose. Um, I, I personally, I don't find that a very convincing, but, but let's grant him that. Um, that's why I brought up uh, another possible counterexample, walking on a treadmill, where you're using your locomotive faculty, your legs, 
um, and you're doing it in a way that's specifically intended not to take you somewhere. You don't want to go somewhere when you're walking on a treadmill, and that's why you use the treadmill instead of walking out to, to some other destination. Um, so I only make that point uh, just to illustrate how counterintuitive it is to think that any each distinct bodily faculty has its own intrinsic telos that is uh, ethically binding and, and really has this sort of remarkably over powerful and overriding normative force um, that of course the Catholics want to give to any use of the sexual faculty. And, but because they they put this in terms of every bodily faculty having a normative telos, then they have to defend the broader claim that applies to things like the digestive faculty and the locomotive faculty. I also mentioned the respiratory faculty, breathing. Uh, so what about the case where you, you know, just inhale some helium to make your voice sound weird? Well, you know, they're using the respiratory faculty for an end that is not at all supplying oxygen. You're deliberately breathing something other than oxygen. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And it's silly to to kind of create an ethics in which, you know, in my opinion, it's silly to even, in which you even have to ask this sort of question because um, there's nothing in the Bible and there's nothing in Aristotle or even Plato or the Stoics that would commit you to anything like this. It's just a, a kind of an artifact of the distinctive way that the scholastics had of codifying this idea of the sin against nature. So, um, yeah, like in the passage you read, the point I was making was that natural law, the way it was classically understood, does have a theistic foundation. See, that's another thing that's going on in the Phaser article and this whole so-called perverted faculty argument. Um, uh, it's, it's explicitly a secular argument. And he says this in the article, that he tries to present it in a way that uh, where it doesn't depend on your theistic commitments beforehand. Um, and I think that's also fruitless. Um, you know, St. Paul in Romans, that's where the idea of something being contrary to nature figures so prominently within Christian thought. And he begins Romans one by saying that, um, the reality of God is evident from nature and, and it's precisely the attempt to deny that evident <laughs> presence of God within nature, um, well, that leads us into sin that sort of accompanies sin, uh, of course, initially idolatry, but then also sexual sin. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's much to be gained by trying to, to dislodge natural law from a theistic context. And one thing I like about um, Plato, who's the first to speak of things being, of sexual acts being contrary to nature, okay, and that that's also something I was alluding to in the passage you read, that Plato in the Laws says that same-sex intercourse is contrary to nature, par effusion. Uh, St. Paul is probably, you know, because of Plato, that that, um, that particular idiom in relation to same-sex intercourse kind of enters the Greek language. And St. Paul is probably just, you know, adopting that kind of as a common idiom in use of that time. Um, um, anyway, but even for Plato, it's a theistic context because Plato says in the Timaeus that uh, the Demiurge, the creator gave us sexual pleasure in order to try to kind of encourage and enable procreation. Um, so there's that, that theistic context that's present from the beginning uh, with Plato, with Aristotle, with the Stoics, with Middle Platonism, like I mentioned, and then people like Cicero and Philo of Alexandria, they all just take this for granted that natural law really involves uh, discerning the intent of the creator as it's evident in the structure and function of the body, uh, at least when you're talking about you know, natural law in a human context. And um, that doesn't kind of reduce to, <laughs> I trying to identify a separate telos for each bodily faculty. Okay, that's what they don't do. They think you can, though, look at the structure and function of the human body, and you can recognize that um, the male genital organs is meant to be used with the female 
reproductive system and vice versa, that there's a kind of a key and lock quality to the way they fit together uh, and the way they jointly act to enable reproduction. Um, and that's not true of, of male with male or female with female. So, um, you know, to that extent, I, I think Phaser is right. And I, I'm not arguing with all of his conclusions. I simply think that uh, he's picked the wrong ground to fight on by trying to present a, per, a purely secular version of natural law that is based on this idea of, of each bodily faculty having a telos. Is it, is you, it more um, the fact if, that- If I may um, continue. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, you had, in another quotation later on, <clears throat> you had talking about helium and the treadmill. You had said that, uh, let's see, um, that you can use a normal faculty for something other than its natural end without in any way preventing that faculty from performing its natural function the next time it is used. And I thought that was a very poignant point because uh, someone whom uh, Lewis knows had pointed out that simply because they you know, are intimate with their wife while using birth control doesn't mean that they cannot go to not using it later on. And it doesn't mean that the relationship in and of itself is not geared towards, or rather it's, it's Talos is not the reproduction of children. So the question is, does each act have to have a Talos directed towards having children, in which case natural family planning is completely off the table because you cannot have sex in non-fertile times? Or could it rather be that the relationship has a Talos in reproduction of children, or maybe the Talos itself is intimacy between couples, a unit of act? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you all brought out in your video, um, I think a couple of points that are relevant there. Uh, one is that when the prohibition on contraception first becomes prominent, it's in Augustine. And um, he's just as vocal against the rhythm method as he is against the use of contraceptive potions. Okay, for him, they're, they're equally attempts to uh, enjoy sex without kind of accepting or, or embracing the, the true purpose of sex, which is procreation. And, uh, you know, Noonan also brings this out well in his book on contraception that Augustine is um, quite a rigorist about sex. The, let me just find a passage that I quote in the paper um, from Augustine. I can, yeah, here we go. Um, he says, God permits the delight of mortal flesh to be released from the control of reason in copulation only to propagate progeny. Um, that's from uh, his work against Faustus, one of the anti-Manichaean works. But notice the way he puts it. He, the God permits the delight of mortal flesh to be released from the control of reason only for the purpose of procreation. So that's, I think, a kind of a distinctive feature of the way Augustine thinks about sex is that it's, it's kind of a step down into mm. uh, the level of the flesh um, and away from the control of reason. And, you know, he also says that one sign of our fallen nature is the fact that our sexual organs are not subject to deliberate conscious control um, and that sex, as it would have occurred in the unfallen state, would have been just rationally willed. And, you know, the, the, male, the man could will to have an erection and it would happen, it, you know, and so it would all be very rational. Um, and so that's why he objects to the rhythm method is because the couple are, are sort of enjoying sex. They're, they're entering into that lower level of the flesh that's away from the control of reason, but doing it not for the purpose of procreation. Uh, and he thinks that's sinful. Well, um, that particular passage didn't happen to be one of those that was quoted by Gratian and Peter Lombard in the 1150s. And so it doesn't enter into the scholastic discourse about the sin against nature. Um, unlike the one about contraceptive potions that does enter. Um, as well as other things, you know, in, in the Confessions, Augustine also says that the, the sin of the Sodomites was against nature. And so, of course, that enters in a very prominent 
way. Um, but it's, all, it's kind of a matter of historical accident that the rhythm method sort of doesn't become central in the discussion of contraception the way the contraceptive potions do. And so later, much later actually in the 19th century, um, the papal teaching begins to relax and says, okay, the rhythm method, actually we can accept that, that's okay, but just no artificial contraceptives. Um, and so it's, it seems to me, if you look at this historically, you know, and Noonan brings this out very well in that book, um, it's, there's just a lot of historical accident that takes place. And now people today, the, the Catholics, the traditionalist Catholics like Fazer are left in the position of trying to sort of rationalize what is largely a matter of historical happenstance. Um, I forget I forget what your question was, but I hope this is kind of getting at the point that, um, yeah, to focus on individual acts the way that the, the, that the Catholic natural law argument does, I think is, is a little misguided. Um, not to say that there are not acts that are always intrinsically wrong, of course there are, um, but if you try to make that your guiding principle for sexual ethics. <laughs> there are a lot of things you're going to, um, you know, end up overlooking or just not doing justice to because sex is a very complex activity, even in marriage, you know, even in a, a married couple, there are things that can be right in some contexts and wrong in other contexts. And that's why uh, in orthodoxy, you have a father confessor and ideally a, a spiritual father, you know, someone you actually go to for regular guidance uh, who can help you achieve the right kind of um, practice that really does show love to your spouse and really does fulfill all your obligations as a husband or wife. And, and that often involves a lot more than just, you know, do this and don't do that. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more subtle than that. So. Yeah, that was. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't have a question per se. I simply was presenting as a jumping off point. But yes, you very much uh, elaborated on it in a way that uh, I found edifying. Here ends the first half. If you would like to listen to the second half of the video, please visit us on our Patreon page found in the links below. And special thanks to our current Patreon subscribers, whose generosity has allowed us to create more material like this and at more regular intervals.